I'm David Fridley. I'm a staff scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in Berkeley, California. A lot of people are looking to biofuels as kind of that silver bullet that's going to both substitute for uh, an increasingly scarce oil supply and at the same time uh, have lower CO2 emissions and contribute to uh, mitigation of, of climate change. But uh, I think the hopes uh, put on to biofuels are way overstated. The reason that we are so addicted to petroleum is because of the basic characteristics of petroleum. And one of them is uh, it's a liquid. The second is that it's a very energy dense liquid. And third, they're very stable, mobile, and, and can provide a great deal of energy per unit mass. Biofuels, on the other hand, uh, don't have those characteristics. Even if you make them into the liquid, they don't have the same energy density of petroleum. Biofuels also are produced from biomass, and biomass is very dispersed. It's everywhere around us. It's, uh, it requires harvesting it. It requires drying it, moving it, processing it, turning it into a fuel. And the energy requirements to do that, in the case of corn ethanol, for example, uh, equals the amount of energy that we get out of it. Biomass supply is not unlimited. Um, biomass itself has low energy density. So for it to be economic to even make biofuels, the supply has to come uh, from within 50 to 200 miles of where the plant is. I mean, this contrast uh, enormously with the case of oil, where we can drill uh, several miles under the ocean offshore Angola in Africa, uh, put it on a ship, bring it to the U.S., refine it, pipe it, deliver it to a service station, and still sell it for $3 a gallon. That's simply going to be impossible in the case of biofuels. We have um, 80 million acres under cultivation with corn, 80 million. Uh, this year, the planting intentions are up to 90 million to produce more corn. Um, there's two problems there. One is even with our 80 million acres, and this is one quarter of all the planted land in the United States, uh, if, even if we converted all of that to, to ethanol, it would not supply more than 12% of our gasoline demand. Um, so to, to bring it up to 50% or 85% simply is impossible given the amount of land we have under cultivation. Further, you have to question, do you want the fuel or do you want the food? The trade-off is now, are we willing to pay more for all of our foodstuffs because effectively we've turned our food industry into a food and energy industry. And ultimately we've now linked the price of our foods to the price of oil. The gasoline that we use are in internal combustion engines that are finely tuned and optimized for use with gasoline. Uh, what that means in consequence is that when you produce that ethanol, you have to produce a very fine, pure grade of it. Uh, this is not the moonshine that you used to get from your backyard still. It has to be 99.5% pure uh, with no water in it. Um, otherwise, it won't work properly with the engine and can indeed damage it. But what that means in turn is even though uh, it is possible in a local small scale still to produce a high quality ethanol, it can't be produced beyond 95% purity. There's a, a chemical reason that that's the case. To take it that next step to the 99.5% requires high pressure vessels, high temperatures, and special uh, materials called zeolites that can dehydrate those water molecules out of it. And so absent that kind of, kind of small scale local technology, it really is very difficult uh, to achieve a local production of ethanol that could seamlessly substitute for gasoline in our current types of engines. But uh, ironically, if you look back in time, for example, in the 1930s, there were engines that ran on so-called hydrous ethanol, ethanol that has water in it. 
And if we could kind of turn the clock back to a simpler form of an internal combustion engine, then, for example, the, the promise of local ethanol production might be possible.